Good evening, folks. It's Diamond from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project and Magnetic Reversal News. And tonight, we are going to delve into the postlude to the Adam and Eve story. One of the most sought-after 27-page pamphlets currently. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the Adam and Eve story by Chan Thomas, which many think was classified and a sanitized copy was released by the CIA. Now, very little of this information is true. And I'm going to bring you over to a January 9th article from ExoPolitics. Massive pole shifts are cyclic according to the declassified CIA document. Now, the document in question, the Adam and Eve story by Chan Thomas, was never classified. But what was classified was the interrogation of several people involved in the creation of it. The book itself was always available to the public, published in small numbers and very hard to find until the advent of the internet. Now, prior to all these fake news stories coming out about the classified Adam and Eve story, the price of the book has jumped 1,000 times. You could get a pamphlet for 20 bucks last year, and now they're listed on eBay for 2,000. And this is because of dis disinformation. Now, Ben Davidson, founder of Space Weather News, has a 20 or 30 part Earth catastrophe cycle video series. And in the beginning, he gave some bad information. Now, friends of his channel have uncovered his misspeakings. And one of the biggest things that shocked me was Ben claimed that Chan Thomas wasn't even a person. But Chan Thomas has published many books, even into the 1970s. And he was even on Johnny Carson, but we'll get to that. But what's most important is that most of you think that this document was classified, which it was not. It was always available in the public. It was the CIA interrogation of those involved that were classified. And Chan Thomas is a real person. Now, let's go back to what this story talks about. The Adam and Eve story itself talks about cosmic catastrophe, crustal slip. And it does so in a very fantastic fashion, which would scare the out of a lot of people. It claims that massive pole shifts are cyclic. Now let's get to the real science. Many esoteric scientists, geologists, paleontologists, and archaeologists are all coming to the same conclusions. That our geologic past over the last few million years, when humans have lived on Earth, has been one of episodic and periodic catastrophe continuously erasing the memory of what happened prior again and again and again when you're looking at the clock cycle as described by Doug Vogt you're looking at the yuga cycle as described by many people in India and the Hindus you're looking at the astrological wheel used by astrologers worldwide to give you your chart. This is the procession of the equinoxes, the 26,000 year clock cycle, which drives the procession of Earth, the wobbling of the north axial rotational pole, and it changes the northern rotational view slowly one degree every lifetime which is why when we look into ancient cultures their buildings the work of hamlet's mill it sh clearly shows that ancient cultures knew about this cycle now how do we know about a cycle which erases all memory of it again and again and again Clearly, that's being handed down. This is the most important piece of the puzzle. 
which is why it has lasted. Now we're about to read verbatim, word for word, the postlude to the Adam and Eve story, which came out in 71, seven years after the Adam and Eve story itself, eight years after the Adam and Eve story was first printed. Almost impossible to get because everyone wants a piece of it, and there's not many of them. Now let's talk about Chan Thomas as an author and a researcher. Chan Thomas appeared on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson on the 7th of April, 1965. Here is the episode. Proof. Chan Thomas is a human. Chan Thomas has a second famous book called Body 2, The Incredible World of ESP. Now it's clear... that the human, the real person, Chan Thomas, was erased by the CIA and other people. Erased, literally, from the face of the earth. You can find little information on this man, except that he actually was at on the Johnny Carson show. Oops. And he has many other books he printed. He just doesn't have a couple books. The Natural Childbirth, Self-Taught. And Chan was into many holistic things. Just an awesome person that had to go into hiding. Way ahead of the curve, decades ahead. Now I found this, The Musings of a Mystic Wizard by Michael Weaver years ago. And it's amazing because the first time I read it, it doesn't read the same as I read it now. And if you want to know the truth about Chan Thomas and what happened about that story, Please read this blog. I implore you. The links will be below. Chan Thomas dis discusses crustal displacement, catastrophic geology. Now you're looking at a model of what that would look like. Here's the earth spinning and the earth will slow down as the magnetic field slows. And you can see the wind and the water keeps going. And then the crust slips. This is a catastrophic event which can take days. We're looking at it in just three daily rotations of crustal slip. And then finally settling down there, Antarctica is at the equator. And so is the Arctic. Now, this would definitely result in catastrophic tsunamis the likes of which you couldn't even imagine. And also high winds. Because as the planet slows, the winds do not. The water does not slow its movement. Because of centri centrifugal force, it keeps going. But if the crust detaches at the Mohorovic discontinuity, or the upper mantle boundary, we're screwed because it will literally slow down and winds will increase from 30 miles an hour to 5, 800, 1200 miles per hour instantly. Well, it would take about an hour or so to speed up depending on the amount of slip. There's no way to know, but the entire concept is plausible. It's possible because of our lack of information of what actually happens down there. We can't drill that far. We can only use seismic activity to interpret the speed of the PNS waves, to make an educated guess on what is happening with the crust, the ocean. Plate tectonics is a guess to best explain the observations. And the crustal slip model best explains the unexplainable. Now to the postlude, to the Adam and Eve story. Frozen mammoths, the Grand Canyon, the Jura Mountains, Tiwanaku, Bode's Law, Baalbek, Sacsayhuaman, Easter Island, Niagara Falls, St. Anthony's Falls, Shanadar Cave, Gilgamesh, the Greek alphabet, the trigger, the work of Doug Vogt, the clock cycle. 
Printed in 1971, second printing 1972. Slowly, painstakingly, we are still putting the pieces of the puzzle together. The more pieces we find which fit into the picture, the more colorful and dramatic the picture becomes. I wish we had the funds to dig and search for three years in Tiwanaku. A small idea of what could be found in this prehistoric city of South America can be gained by reading two books, both written by Hans Schindler Bellamy and Peter Allen, The Calendar of Tiwanaku and The Great Idol of Tiwanaku. The conclusions drawn through these monumental works are startlingly close to mine. Jan Thomas. The city has lived through at least three epochs, the oldest ending 11,500 years ago, terminating with a cataclysm. Clearly the younger Dryas. The period in its history when it was at sea level and starting a period of 5,000 years during which it was at the bottom of the Pacific and then an upheaval 6,500 years ago when it was raised with its ocean floor home to its present altitude of 12,500 feet during the cataclysm which produced Noah's flood, gave birth to Niagara Falls and started the Ohio River flowing into the Mississippi. Started the Neolithic Stone Age, raised the level of the oceans more than 200 feet all over the world and initiated the era of modern history on Earth such as that of Greece, Egypt, and India, and gave birth to the Epic of Gilgamesh, containing the story of Noah's Flood, written by the Sumerians thousands of years before the Hebrews wrote it in Genesis. Each cataclysm is like a giant hand sweeping across the countryside, leaving its fingerprints for us to find as we sift through the evidence in our search for the solution to this consuming mystery. <clears throat> These fingerprints sometimes are well hidden amongst the heavy footprints of uniformitarian evidence. The two disciplines, uniformitarian geology and cataclysmology, find no real contest between them. They complement each other and actually a marriage of the two schools is in order. Some of the cataclysmic fingerprints have been mentioned in chapter two. Let's discuss them in more detail. The story of frozen mammoths is intriguing indeed. No frozen mammoth was ever found in ice. All have been found in frozen mud. Perhaps the most noted of the thousands found thusly in Bereshkova mammoth found near Bereshkova River in northern Siberia. Like all mammoths found wherein some comment was made concerning the skull, it was noted that its skull was pink from hemorrhaging in the head, denoting death through suffocation by drowning in the mud. The Beroscopa mammoth was found in 1900, and more scientific data was gathered and recorded about this animal than any other such frozen behemoth. It appears that this beast also has initiated more scientific controversy than any other such find. To my way of thinking, one man's work stands far above all others, Ivan T. Sanderson, the biologist. He approached the problem from a frozen foods viewpoint and was the first to do so. This is his story. When you freeze meat, the problem is to freeze it fast enough so the moisture contained in the meat does not have time to form into large crystals while freezing. The faster the freeze, the smaller the crystals. If you freeze meat too slowly, the moisture will form crystals large enough to destroy the fibrous structure of the meat. When defrosted, the meat will be nothing more than a mass of goo, unfit to cook or eat. The larger piece of meat to free be frozen, the more difficult it is to freeze it fast enough to avoid the formation of these destructive moisture crystals. For heat must be removed at the same rate from, say, half a steer as from half a pound of ground meat. It would be the same problem if you had to freeze a bucket of water in the same time it takes to freeze a thimbleful. 
it almost sounds impossible. Like you need a some sort of a probe in the middle to be cooling it at the same time. Now, a mammoth, this five-ton behemoth, how in the world could we freeze a mammoth instantly and keep it frozen for thousands of years where we can thaw it and actually feed the meat to our animals? How is that possible? The Siberian mammoth was smaller, but still a several-ton animal, the one they found in 1900. When the Bereskova mammoth was dissected by Russian scientists in 1901, they recorded the event. The innermost lining of the beast's stomach had perfectly preserved fibrous structure, indicating that the body heat had been removed from the mammoth by some super prodigious process in nature, which we have no idea about. There is no modern analog. There is no uniformitarianism for this particular problem. Now, Sanderson noted this one point, and he took the problem to the American Frozen Foods Institute, and he asked them this simple question. What does it take to freeze an entire mammoth so that moisture crystallization does not have time to form in the inner lining of its stomach? The Institute really attacked this problem. To freeze a quarter or a half a steer presented a big enough problem, but the whole mammoth Some weeks later, the Institute went back to Sanderson with the answer. They said it is impossible. Yet Anderson knew it was possible because he had the proof. He had the data. He had the mammoth. Now, with all of our scientific and engineering knowledge, there is absolutely no known way to remove the body heat from a carcass as big as a mammoth fast enough to freeze it without moisture crystals forming in the meat, especially the stomach. Are you kidding me? Furthermore, after exhausting the scientific and engineering techniques, they looked to nature and concluded that there is no known process in nature which could accomplish the feat, thanks to uniformitarianism. So many have loosely claimed that the Bereskova mammoth fell in a crevasse or fell into the ice or some such nonsense, which even it, if it had done that, would have not produced the frozen animal we see today. There is absolutely, positively, irrevocably no explanation in the known uniformitarianistic model of nature to explain the quick freezing of Bereskova mammoth. And the muck in which it was suffocated and drowned, well, that's a whole nother story. The Institute did tell Sanderson what it takes to do the job. However, first of all, the body temperature of the mammoth must be lowered about 140 degrees from its normal operating temperature instantly. And it must be accomplished in an absolute outside limit of four hours. Actually, they concluded the freezing process would have to take place closer to two hours in order to accomplish this impossible feat, be it in two or four hours, an infinite supply of cold would be necessary. And not just ordinary ice cold, but closer to 80 degrees below zero or lower. That is the minimum threshold. Moreover, after the mammoth was drowned in muck and quick freezing in and within it, he had to be kept at that temperature for thousands of years to be preserved as he was when he was discovered just 100 years ago. The whole process bespeaks of an inhuman supernatural violence of freezingness. One foreleg, some ribs, and its pelvis were fractured. It was buried in muck alive, suffocated and drowned in the muck, and frozen to minus 80 degrees within two hours. But nonetheless, the process was performed, and the mammoth was kept frozen 
for thousands upon thousands of years. Now, where did the muck come from? This frozen mud can be found all over northern Siberia and Alaska. In Alaska, the frozen blanket ranges from 20 to 90 feet thick. Where we, where we have been able to study this frozen tundra more closely, the evidence shows that the supernatural violence included supersonic winds, volcanic eruptions, swift inundation creating the muck, sudden temperature change to sub-zero freezing, and a precipitous total environment climatic change. The muck comes from the inundation waters moving so swiftly and in such fantastic quantities that the water picks up all kinds of earth, mixes and homogenizes it with water, then lays it down in the muck layer, similar to concrete. Vivid descriptions of this layer of frozen muck are given by Professor Frank C. Hibben in his book, The Lost Americans. One of the best places to study many layers of the muck laid down by many cataclysms in the walls of the Grand Canyon or in the Badlands of North Dakota. If you stand on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, pick one strata to follow and trace it with your eyes as far as you can see in all directions, including the spires jutting upward, you will find that strata homogeneous from top to bottom, laid down with uniform thickness and sharply demarcated from the layers above and below. Sounds like a pack. Furthermore, if you happen to pick up a layer that contains gravel and rocks interspersed through it, you will observe that rock, boulders, and gravel are distributed throughout the layer evenly, top to bottom. There is absolutely on, only one way for each layer to have been laid down so evenly and homogeneously all at once. All other hypotheses fade into oblivion in the light of the homogeneity factor. I disagree there. This conclusion as to the suddenness of the deposit based on the homogeneity factor is strengthened further by the flatness, uniformity of thickness, and the independent character of each layer and the sharp demarcation between layers. <laughs> Anyone in the earth moving business who looks at these strata with the suddenness of deposit of each layer in mind will immediately realize that there is absolutely no way to accomplish this feat through any known means of engineering. Nor is there any known way in the ordinary process of nature to move that much earth, homogenize it, even with rocks and boulders if necessary, and deposit it all at once, unless it was catastrophic and a flood. The only way possible is for cubic miles upon cubic miles of water to move at fantastic speeds over the continents, pick up earth, dirt, in an unbelievable quantity, mix it with water into a watery mud, and finally deposit all at once in a layer of homogenized muck, which later dries out and through the ages sometimes ossifies. A good measure of the speed with which the water must move over the land is provided for us by the granitic blocks on the eastern slopes of the Jura Mountains in France. De Luc Sr., Von Buch, De Luc Jr., and De Sauceveux give us much information through their early geologic observations of the dispersion of the alpine granite blocks through the mountains, valleys, and lakes of Italy, Switzerland, and France. Even Blackwell, through his early dissenting observations, lends more credence to the fast-moving water conclusions of other men because of his loose arguments. The great Swiss geologist Escher gave the most credence to the water argument through his observations, which support the earliest concepts set forth by André Dulac Jr. in the 1820s. <coughs> now, let us envision the Jura Mountains as if we were looking down from space. First of all, we would notice they are similar to the Allegheny Mountains in Pennsylvania, my stomping ground, for they look like giant wrinkled up carpet with rolling ridges running from northeast to southwest. The Swiss-French border follows the same direction in the middle of the range. You can also see that the ridges have passes through them here and there so that a person on the ground can see northwest through one ridge 
to the southeastern slope of the next. Here in the Poconos or the Appalachians, we call them wind gaps or water gaps. It's a well-known fact that the Jura Mountains are non-granitic, just like the Poconos or the Appalachians. They're sedimentary. Whatever granite exists in the mountains is buried deep beneath them in both places. But in the Jura, granite lies on top. The eastern slopes of the ridges in the Jura are countless granite blocks sitting on the surface. These blocks, each weighing tons upon tons, have been traced to the Alps over 50 miles away across the Swiss Valley to the southeast. If you look several ridges to the northwest in the Juras, you will find the granite blocks only on the southeastern slope of these ridges and clustered only opposite passes through the ridge adjacent to the southeast. Now, that means that some catastrophic water source had to take them from the Alps 50 to 80 miles across Switzerland to where they now rest in order for them to be found on the southeastern slopes of the Juras where they are. A tremendous upheaval of granite in the Italian Swiss Alps had to occur during some cataclysmic violence like a boom event followed by water moving at such fantastic speeds as to sweep the mighty blocks of granite from 50 to 80 miles across Switzerland over the Juras, through the passes, and deposit them in clusters against the southeastern slopes of the inner ridges as if they were sand grains on the beach. A beach of which ocean we will never know, or will we? Now, this fits perfectly with the picture of supernatural violence uncovered by Professor Frank C. Hibben in his studies of shredded and dismembered prehistoric animals in Alaska, buried and frozen in a muck with twisted, torn, and burned trees. Holy bee's knees. Now, Hibben states that one necessary force in the contributing factors is supersonic winds. And we showed you how that's possible. As the crust slows, the wind doesn't stop. If the crust slips and we back up, wind will go from 50 miles an hour in some areas to 500 within a period of an hour. Depends on the speed of the slip. All the wind, all the water's moving at 1,800 miles an hour this way. And then it slows down. It, the wind and water continue to move at that speed. But the crust doesn't. And it's literally a sandblasting of the surface of the earth and a reorganization of continents. Just like that. The only possible means of generating such winds over tremendous areas of land is to move the land in such a way as to depart from its normal west to east daily rotation. So the atmosphere, continuing its normal rotation, will then be moving at supersonic speeds relative to the land over which it's moving. And this will be completely variable. Depending on how the slip occurs, in one area it will be the fastest, other areas there will be no wind. It's impossible to predict. Now in the Earth's normal daily rotation, the ocean also rotates west to east once per day. When a cataclysm occurs, the shell of the earth slips in a direction differing from that of its normal rotation. And the atmosphere continues its normal rotation direction. The oceans also refuse to change their rotational direction. If you don't know what I mean, get a cookie sheet, fill it with water, run across the room and stop abruptly. The water will roll off of that sheet. The atmosphere and the oceans proceed to move over land masses, which are passing underneath them in a new direction. Some of the oceans moving at supersonic speeds with respect to land, and some of the atmosphere moving at supersonic speeds as well. With oceans moving over land masses at such speeds, it's easy to understand how huge granite blocks were moved 80 miles from the Alps to the Juras, 
while losing very little altitude and how cubic miles of earth can be picked up, mixed with water, homogenized, super freezing entire mammoths and then laid down in an even flat independent layer such as we find in the Grand Canyon or even in Siberia. We can understand how the irresistibly, overwhelmingly annihilating force of the waters moving at utterly unbelievable speeds like 1,200 mile an hour tsunami. Are you kidding me? That's a lot. Now we can understand how irresistibly, overwhelmingly, annihilatingly force of the waters moving at utterly unbelievable speeds can, in the blink of an eye, obliterate entire civilizations and every vestige of anything they have ever accomplished instantly. Even in our times, there have been occasions when a simple dam breaking and releasing its waters over a small town below literally wipes out every splinter of evidence of that town and people have ever been there. One of the fingerprints which the giant cataclysm hand leaves telling us of this supernatural violence on earth is the plethora of mammalian teeth found in the sharp demarcation boundary between earth strata such as we see in the Grand Canyon. And it bespeaks of animal life being pulverized to bits with teeth, the only mammalian substance hard enough to withstand the onslaught. When I read that, whew, that sunk home because I've seen that. I know where to collect those teeth. But there is good news geologically. The teeth layers are only every 100,000 to million years. It's a different major cycle. They do not happen every 20,000 years, thankfully. Some places undergo less violent winds and inundation, to be sure. And there we find traces of prehistoric civilizations, which had advanced to achievements we deem impossible to this day. Now let's go back to Tiwanaku in South America and see what's there. <clears throat> the Incas discovered this deserted city at 12,500 feet altitude on the shores of Lake Titicaca in the second century AD. Although they lived in that land for generations upon generations, centuries after centuries, they left it virtually undisturbed. Anyone who has been on the hunt for gold or treasure in the mountains, as I have in New Mexico, knows the Indian philosophy that what is in the mountains belongs in the mountains. What they find they do not disturb, touch, or destroy. You can read about it, see it portrayed in movies, or be told about it, but there is absolutely nothing like seeing in person when gold fever takes over an entire personality. It's a kind of consummate greed which changes a vet veteran outdoorsman into a wild-eyed, scheming, secretive, intense introvert who could lead himself and others to destruction and death through his greed. Are you listening, Mark Axon? I've seen it. Tiwanaku was found by Pizarro and his band of plunderers in the 1520s. The gold fever had evidently taken over his entire expedition of 13 to 16 men, for they proceeded to vandalize and destroy almost everything in sight. They smashed thousands of statues looking for gold inside. There were huge silver bolts of up to several tons each passing through massive stone monoliths. You guessed it, they broke up the monoliths and stole the silver. These scumbags have destroyed more of our historical past than any government in history. There was one member of the early discoverers, a Spanish priest, Diego de Alcabasco, who wrote down what they saw and why we are not taking Spain to court for these crimes against humanity is beyond me. Because we have quotes from the 1500s. I saw a vast hall carved on its roof to represent thatch. There were the waters of the lake which washed the walls of a splendid court in this city of the dead and standing in this fine court 
in the shallows of the water on the platform of a superb colonnade where many fine statues of men and women. So real were they that they seemed to be alive. Some had goblets and upraised drinking cups. Others sat or reclined as in life. Some walked in the stream flowing by the ancient walls. Women carved in stone dandled babies in their laps or bore them on their backs. And thousand natural postures, people stood or reclined. None of these statues exist today. The greed of civilization has literally devastated Tiwanaku with vandalism and thievery. The historical documents and the descriptions of what was once there are fraudulent, unfactual, made up by the plunderers themselves. Vandals through the centuries who have visited the, this fabulous storehouse of prehistory did what most do who have their treasure fever. They ignored the intellectual values which were less obvious and destroyed it all. The great stone gate in the temple of Kalasea has inscriptions across its arch which to the untrained eye appear to be but meaningless picture carvings. And it remained for Arthur Poznanski to realize its importance. He was followed by Wendell Bennett and John Phillips, then Hans Schindler, Bellamy, and Peter Allen completed the picture with their brilliant deciphering and translations of the pictures, so aptly described in their book, The Calendar of Tiwanaku. I implore you to get it. Their later work, The Great Idol of Tiwanaku, evinces further their brilliance in deciphering and translating the picture symbols carved in a monolithic statue excavated from a burial temple. The only thing they don't explain is why this huge statue has two left hands. <coughs> I'm left-handed. The works of Bellamy and Allen show many things concerning the calendar and time standards of Tiwanaku in two different epochs. Between hours, days, and years, then and now, I shall leave to those who wish to read these books. The main point of the discussion worth noting here is that the idol and the calendar in both eras recorded the orbiting of a retrograde moon satellite around Earth, which is not here today. During the idol's era, 29,185 years ago, the satellite was 24,150 miles from Earth. During the calendar's gate era, probably 18 to 11.5, the satellite was 23,000 miles from Earth. Obviously, the moon satellite was far closer to our planet than our present moon. Obviously, it passed the Roche limit of approximately 8,000 miles from the Earth and disintegrated. Where did that moon satellite come from? How did our planet capture it? And where did our present moon come from? When did our planet capture it? If Tiwanaku has made any sense, these questions must be answered. Now the Bode-Titus relationship may give us a key to the answer. Titius and Bode, two German astronomers, discovered this relationship in the 18th century. And if we take a ring number or orbit numbers of the planets 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Multiply each number by 3 and divide by 4. Add 4, divide by 10. You get the picture. These numbers represent the relative distances then known of the planets from the Sun. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. With 2.8 representing a void with no known planet at that distance. Is that your Nibiru? Is that Tiamat? I believe it is, but it's not there anymore. When the planet Uranus was discovered in 1781, it fit right into the series at 196. The law seemed strengthened, and an intense search was started for anything that might be at 2.8 distance. In 1801, the little planetoid Ceres was found, and by 1945, more than 1,500 more were found at that same orbit. It has been well established as the ring of minor planets or planetoids or asteroids. In 1846, Neptune was discovered and it seemed to disobey the rules set down by Bode and Titius. 
It should have been at 33.8 on the relative distance scale, but it was closer to 29.2. In 1930, Pluto was discovered and Bode Titius seemed to fall apart. For Pluto was found close to 38.8, where Neptune was supposed to be. Whereas the Bode Titius law seemed to indicate that Pluto should be at 77.2. Since then, the relationship, commonly known as Bode's Law, has been regarded in astronomy as nothing more than an insignificant curiosity. Perhaps a new look at Bode's Law is in order. If so much of it is correct, then perhaps the part which appears to be erroneous seems to be so only because of our lack of understanding of the basics involved. First, instead of using relative distances, we shall work with ring numbers or orbit numbers. 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 represents these numbers. Also, instead of this progression, which is geometric except for 0, let's fill it all in, making a true arithmetic progression. The numbers would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on to 256. Now, in this progression, the ring numbers... 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and 256 can be regarded as fundamental rings due to the primer fields. All of the rings can be regarded as harmonic rings. Between any two fundamentals, the rings which lie halfway between is the first harmonic. And any ring which lies halfway between a fundamental and the first harmonic is a second harmonic. And so on and so forth. The first thing we notice is that all of the planets are on fundamentals, except for Neptune. It's the only one of all the planets which is on a harmonic ring, as it appears on the first harmonic between Uranus and Pluto, which are on fundamentals 64 and 128. Now we come to another discovery. The number of rings between planets increases the further away from the sun the planets are until it appears that the maximum number of rings possible between planets is 31. On each 32nd ring, there has to be a planet, whether that ring is fundamental or harmonic. That's why Neptune is on its 32nd ring after Uranus, with Pluto on the 32nd ring after Neptune. Something else appears apparent. When the solar system was born, disregard that statement, Planets tried to be born on each ring. Also untrue. Full-blown planets were born on every fundamental and on any harmonic. Now, I think that what happens here, if you know about primer fields and you know about orbitals, the planets can only rest in these primary rings. They weren't born there. They can only exist there. So if we shot a new planet into our solar system, it would find a ring, a harmonic. Before we examine the results of our construction, let's look at the utter unknown regions of the solar system. Ring number 256 is where the comets turn around and head back into the heart of the system. Further, it is also known from the perturbations in Pluto's orbit that there is more than one planet outside Pluto. Our table tells us that there should be three planets on rings, number 160, number 192, and number 224. The total number of rings tells that there is a fantastic number of captured and uncaptured minor planets yet to be discovered. It's apparent that our present moon was created on ring three. Phobos, number five. Deimos, number six. Ring number seven is vacant. That presents a real challenge. Whatever happened to the minor planet from ring seven? Boom time. The closest of Phobos and Deimos to Mars tells us that rings number four, five, and six close together at a tremendous amount, most probably through a succession of events in the solar system causing the series of cataclysms on Earth. It's logical that Ring 7 also would have closed towards Mars so that Mars would have captured the minor planet from Ring 7 as well as Phobos and Deimos. Once orbiting around Mars, lost, could have come close enough to the Earth to be stolen from Mars. 
by the earth and be the moon satellite so well described in the idol and calendar gate of Tiwanaku. The multiple legends springing from the cataclysm of 11,500 years ago, Venus moving into orbit or Venus changing her orbit, most probably describe the capture of our present moon from ring number three, which in its day, eons ago, evidently was a pretty fair planet orbiting about the sun. In any case, the now vacant ring seven that records from Tiwanaku of a retrograde orbiting moon, the plethora of impact craters on the moon and Mars and the mountains of dense material buried in the middle in the mantle of the earth has uncovered by pre perturbed orbits of our man-made satellites. And Bode's law expanded to include harmonics now offers an orderly, an orderly meaning to us. <clears throat> this is a tough read. 13 pages in, and we're at instabilities in the solar system, which lead to capture of minor planets by major planets. And I think it's time to close off the first half of the reading of the postlude. Tomorrow night, I will continue with the final 13 pages. And if the beginning presentation tantalized you. Tomorrow night, my conclusions will blow your mind. Chan Thomas is real. Crustal displacement is probably real. There are many people on the internet coming together to bring out the truth, the truth of your amnesia. Join us tomorrow night for the second half of the postlude to the Adam and Eve story and to find out what is driving all of this. What is the mechanism? Why do the winds increase so abruptly? Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. And watch it again. Watch it again and again and again. Be safe. We love you.